So you've contributed to many of the key open source libraries that data scientists use, including Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, Seaborn, and NumPy. What galvanized you to do that in the first place? Being a software engineer, that's it's kind of in my nature. If I see something that's not working or an example of like, this doesn't make sense, you're using that stuff, you're benefiting from it. And the whole culture of open source is to then you know, pay it forward and give back. Mm -hmm. You see something's wrong, you go fix it, and everyone wins. I think the more you use pandas, the more you will see that just chaining the operations together is going to save you a lot of effort and just make a lot cleaner code. Stephanie, welcome to the Super Data Science <laughs> Podcast. It's awesome to have you here. Thank you for making the trip to record in person with me in New York. You work in New York, so it wasn't too arduous of a journey for you, I hope. No, it was not. And thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So we met in person at ODSC West in San Francisco in the, I don't know, November or maybe late October 2022. Uh, it's going to be like off by, off by one hour there. <laughs> yeah, something like it. it was, it's always around Halloween. Yeah, there. always. And we had a lunch. There were a number of people who I think have been on the show. Matt Harrison, I think, was there. Uh, maybe Serge Massis, our researcher, was there. He, of course, as always, has prepared some amazing questions for you. But we ended up chatting for a really long time, and I found you to be an absolutely fascinating person who clearly knew your stuff. And so I asked you to be on the show, and now it's finally all come together. Um, so you were at ODSC West giving a half-day tutorial on data visualization. And in addition to your brilliant tutorials, you're also an author. So I have Stephanie's gigantic book with me here. It's called Hands-On Data Analysis with Pandas. I've got the second edition. She brought me a signed copy here to film with. And our viewers uh, of the YouTube version can see <laughs> this is really gigantic. The book is almost 800 pages long. And it sounded like Stephanie would have liked to have made it more than 800 pages, but it becomes impossible for a book to be bound, I guess, at that point. Yeah, I mean, it would have been slightly over, but it's just, you know, we're pushing the limits of, of what can be done with a paperback, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's bursting with fabulous information on pandas. And because Stephanie is not only a data scientist, but also a software engineer, there's lots of really practical guidance on how data scientists can be better at writing software. So we're going to talk about that a lot in this episode, but I want to let you know about uh, a generous offer that Stephanie has made. So the first five people to respond to my post about this episode. So on the Tuesday morning, New York time, when these episodes come out, uh, every Tuesday and every Friday when episodes come out, I post that morning uh, from my personal LinkedIn account that the episode is live. And in that, I will mention that the first five people who comment asking for a copy of Stephanie's book will get a free digital copy. And there are some advantages to a digital copy, aren't there? Yes. One of them being it weighs significantly less. <laughs> <laughs> Much less. You might need to buy an like external storage device to handle all of this content. Um, but yeah, generally lighter. Even that, that external hard drive that you carry around to have Steph's book yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will be lighter than the book itself. Um, so yeah, super generous offer. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, so what was your content philosophy when you wrote this book, which um, you've, it, it's clearly been very popular. Second edition came out just two years after the first edition. So first edition, 2019, second edition, 2021, a Korean version came out late 2022, and a Chinese version is expected about a month after um, this podcast episode airs. So uh, yeah, what was your content philosophy um, as you sat down to, to write this gigantic book? So I think uh, it was it was threefold. Uh, the first thing was, as I myself was learning, I was reading a lot of different books, trying to figure out exactly how things worked. And yeah, before you'd even considered writing a book. Before, yeah, this yeah. was just me trying to even transition into a data role mm -hmm. back way back when. Um, and you know, when I got through that process, as, as I finally felt like I was able to, you know, apply some of that knowledge and get into a data role, then I felt that it would be nice to be able to give back to the community and pay it forward the knowledge that I had uh, as a way to also show to myself, you know, look how far you've come that you now have all this knowledge, um, but also to do it in a way that I would have liked to see when I had done that. So, you know, the second point was 
a lot of times the examples were a bit contrived or using random data and it's not, not always clear for newbies to see the connections and how you're actually supposed to apply things. So I wanted to address that. I wanted to be the book that I wanted to have back then. And then the third piece is you would be amazed just how much you learn by having to teach. So you really find where all the holes in your knowledge are and you figure out how to address them and then get across the message that you need to get. Nice, yeah. All of those points resonate with me uh, from my experience writing Deep Learning Illustrated. It felt like the perfect resource for learning deep learning, as far as I was concerned, didn't exist. So it was nice to be able to, to patch that up uh, and create what I believe is that resource. Uh, and then, yeah, also being able to patch up all the gaps in my knowledge, because when you're having to write something, you really start to learn where the holes are, the things that you kind of, um, that you thought you knew maybe, mm -hmm. but that you realized that they were kind of on shaky foundations. So cool. Very nice to hear that. Thank you for creating this, uh, this book for the community. So it's all about data analysis with pandas. What advantages does the pandas library have, other, have over other analytics libraries that uh, somebody might have as options in Python? So I think pandas is kind of a, the, one of the big advantages is that you're going to find it also everywhere. So it kind of has that like market share advantage. You know, if you need to be able to use it in one spot and go somewhere else, you're going to find lots of examples, lots of resources, a big community behind it. Um, and it's also, you know, because it's been around for a while, it's well tested. You can trust that it's going to work. It's going to get the job done. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it to be especially great if you're just prototyping things or just exploring initially. And it's a, it's a great way to get started with um, your analysis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very good reasons. And it's, it's fun, easy to use. We had Wes McKinney uh, in episode number 523. He was the original creator of Pandas. And, and he hasn't been working on pandas uh, for, for several years now. And he described to us in that episode that one of the key reasons behind that was because as data sets have become larger and larger and larger over the years, the kinds of data sets that we're expected to work with as data scientists have grown exponentially larger. And so we're seldom working with data sets on a single machine these days. And so he started working on the Apache Arrow project. So he launched this new project that uh, has a, so in the same way that you say everybody uses pandas, mm -hmm. uh, so even this Apache Arrow project, it has a pandas-like syntax because every data scientist knows how to use it pretty much. And so uh, the advantage of Arrow though is that it allows you to easily uh, in the back end have multiple devices working simultaneously on the data that you're working on, which is harder in pandas until very recently. So just a month ago at the time of this episode's release, it's fresh news for us at the time of recording, is pandas 2.0. And so it's so fresh. Uh, I don't know very much about it yet, but I do understand that the one of the main ideas behind pandas 2.0 is that in the back end, instead of using NumPy, which is optimized just for a single device, it uses Wes McKinney's Apache Arrow in the back end. So uh, Pandas now is extensible over multiple devices. And so maybe someday in the future, Stephanie will have a third edition of your book in Pandas 2.0. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the good news is, um, so from the little bit that I do know about Pandas 2.0 is that uh, apparently most code will still work the same. So it's supposed to have made you know, really no differences to the front end API. A relief for me because a big project coming up this weekend is updating all of my content. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so let's talk about um, how we use pandas. It's uh, clearly great for just wrangling data. Um, the data frame structure is native in it. It's actually something that um, I don't know. I was an R user before. I was too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so data frames were a really convenient way of working with. Uh, two-dimensional tables of data in R because you can have different data types for each column. So if, you know, before I was using R, I was using MATLAB. And in MATLAB, you had to specify the type, at least at, at that time, of the matrix. And so you could have a float type matrix and then everything in that matrix had to be float values. But in R, it was cool having these data frames where you could have a column that was text to describe what the row is or to be an ID um, you could have column names, 
And then each column could be a different data type. So you could have a Boolean, like true false column, and a float column, and an integer column, and a text column, and whatever, all mixed together. And so pandas allowed you to have that in Python. Um, but so data wrangling is this uh, really uh, core part uh, of working with pandas. Is there any uh, aspect of data wrangling that you highly recommend to our listeners in pandas that they might not know about? Um, I guess a few things come to mind, more than what we initially discussed. So one big thing is chaining. Um, I think the more you use pandas, the more you will see that just chaining the operations together is going to save you a lot of effort and just make a lot cleaner code. You don't have end up data frame one, two, three, four, five, six, and you don't remember which order you ran them or which one you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, Assign method that's going to come big when you when you're using the chaining. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Most of my code will end up having assign calls at some point. I feel like people maybe aren't so familiar with that. Yeah, method. I'm not that super familiar. Oh, so, so like so the chaining thing I get. So that's actually so going back to my R days. Even uh, the dplyr yes. library is great, right? Yeah. For for chaining operations together. So then it becomes very easy to look at your code. Or similar, if you you can do it in Bash with the pipe operator where you have operation after operation after operation, and it makes it very easy when you come back to your own code or you're reviewing somebody else's code to see, okay, we have this processing pipeline, for example, or this analytical pipeline where uh, instead of having to name a new data table for each step of the way, you just flow very nicely through all these operations. So it makes for super readable code. So I definitely agree on the chaining, uh, the chaining. Uh, as something uh, that everybody should be doing. And Matt Harrison, who we were saying was at that lunch back at ODSC West, uh, he's in episode number 557 of this podcast. It was actually the most listened to episode in 2022. And a big point that he was making is that everybody should be chaining in that episode. Uh, it was, the episode was called Effective Pandas. And chaining was his like number one thing that people should be doing. Uh, but then you mentioned uh, a sign. A sign. So when you're chaining, let's say you want to create a new variable that's based on some other columns in there, and you want to create a new column, that's just part of the flow. You can create 10, you can overwrite three all in one call, ah, and then move on. Cool. And it works really nicely with um, if you, like, have for some reason want spaces, um, or like let's say you're going to then do a plot right at the end, so chain all the way to a plot, and you want to have nice labels, you might want to have space instead of an underscore. And you can actually do that if you just put it in a dictionary and then unpack it as you're going. So it's a neat trick to have up your sleeve, save you some steps. Cool. This episode is brought to you by Posit, the open source data science company. Posit makes the best tools for data scientists who love open source, period, no matter which language they prefer. Posit's popular RStudio IDE and enterprise products like Posit Workbench, Connect, and Package Manager, these all help individuals, teams, and organizations scale R and Python development easily and securely. Produce higher quality analysis faster with great data science tools. Visit posit.co, that's P-O-S-I-T dot co, to learn more. That sounds awesome. You said you had a few. Were those the... I think the third one maybe is just yeah. like plotting that you can plot in Pandas. I think sometimes people are surprised that that's there. It definitely feels like a, a natural extension. Um, now, I will say that because it is such a high level on top of all these other things, sometimes things aren't quite plugged in yet the right way. Um, I have fixed a couple of those. Uh, personally? Oh, yes, personally. Yeah. Um, uh, so open source contributions. So if someone else finds them, you have to, it's your responsibility to fix them. <laughs> Help us all out. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot uh, later in the episode about the enormous uh, number of open source contributions you've made to all of the major uh, data science libraries in Python. Um, but in the meantime, let's quickly jump into this visualization thing. So yes, people don't always think of pandas as their go-to visualization library, but it can do a surprising amount. And um, you, I realize that there's not always, your workshops and your book don't necessarily overlap, but I know that your workshops, um, if you if you do kind of like your full workshop, it ends in visualization. Yeah, so I have uh, two workshops. I have a pandas workshop that's you know, getting you started in pandas. So it's almost like if this book had like... Uh, Prequel? Kind or, of, yeah. yeah. Like, 
Like that's like your quick whirlwind tour, and then you can dive into the book and like really get a deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't cover eight hundred pages of content in a half day workshop. That feels cruel. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually managed to learn how to speak on double speed. So. <laughs> Buckle up, everybody. Um, no, so the, the workshop is more of your beginner workflow, you know, getting started, just seeing kind of what's available, some examples of commonly used, like very, very common things, getting you to the point where like you understand what a data frame is, you understand how to get data into the data frame, you can wrangle it, and at the end, you know, time permitting, we just do a little bit of plotting. And then my second workshop is just on data visualization. So that one, um, I just assume well, not, not so much assume that you know pandas, but like it's like, here's what our data looks like that we're going to plot. Don't worry about how we got here because the focus is how do we take this and actually make a visual out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and because pandas is so high level with the plotting, there are sometimes things you just, you just can't do unless you then go down a layer and actually work with Matplotlib directly. Uh, so it's very important to be comfortable with that. Nice. And I do have specific questions about visualizations, Matplotlib, why you might use pandas or Matplotlib or other libraries in certain circumstances. But before we get to that, I want to quickly, you weren't expecting me to, to ask you about this, but when we were preparing for this episode, I learned something really interesting about you in terms of how you prepare for workshops. So first of all, tell us about how, depending on the projector, oh, yes. <laughs> you render different slides. So fill us in on that. And then um, you also fill this in on some really cool stuff you're doing with jQuery. Yes. Uh, for interactivity in your presentation. So I think our technical listeners will probably find both of those interesting. Okay. And this is not in support or against jQuery. Just clear that <laughs> up. Uh, so I think, so I, I started getting, I started um, presenting at conferences, um, I guess, 2021, and they were all virtual. And as someone who was not comfortable public speaking at all, that was great, right? Um, but there are some interesting challenges then when you take that on the road in person. Right, so when you're sharing your screen, you know the specs, you know everything fits on the on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's the right size. Everyone can read it because if they're not if they're standing too far away from their laptop, they can fix that. Right, um, with a physical room, not so much. <laughs> so the challenge I had um, with the second, uh, I, I was speaking at PyCon last year, and they sent a very detailed email with the specs of their projector and the minimum sizes and contrasts everything should be. Um, and I'm using um, Reveal.js. Um, so if you create a notebook, a uh, Jupyter notebook, you can actually define um, where the se which cells should be slides and like subslides and fragments. Um, and then from there, you can just export what you have into a slideshow. You make your slideshows in Jupyter notebooks. Yes. Wow. And then Reveal.js is the is what allows you to do that alchemy. Well, so it's a little bit more involved than that. So basically, like baked into uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So if you've ever done like the file, uh, was it like save as or download as? Yeah. There's an option in there for reveal JS slides. There's a bunch of options. And uh, so it's through NB convert. If you're uh, familiar yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then there's templates. And you have to be careful because periodically you update Jupyter. You get a new template. Maybe you don't like the CSS that got changed. Mm. Something's now too big. Header one's massive. What happened to me right before our presentation was header one just like absolutely massive, and then like this just doesn't fit on your screen. Um, and so I spent probably a month trying to come up with some way to alter the slides that would work on a bigger screen, while also still having the ones that work on the smaller screen. And so you end up having to have a lot of challenges where like now you need like images have to be SVG. Because if you're showing a PNG that gets created with like 100 DPI by default, and you try to blow that up, that's going to look really bad on the high resolution projector, right? So part of that then is, is taking the template and you know, flexing your CSS muscles and finding everything that you want to change, that you want to make sure is yours. You know? um, then I have like a lot of hacks in the, the template itself um, using jQuery. So some of the things are to create like different named pages. So if I want this page to be like easily referenced, I can say like, oh, this is section one, and then I can map that to a key one. Or this is talking about uh, the assign method. I can have slash assign, and then it goes right there. And that's automatically computed based on me just adding a tag to that cell. Um, and then the, the final thing, which I'm really excited about, will be released by the time this, this episode airs, is having some more speaker tools, I'll say. 
So I'm going to have like an exercise timer built in using jQuery. Um, things just to give me a, a warning of heads up, like, you know, we're nearing time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that happens with like hotkeys. Yes. Yeah. And so I suspect, well, I mean, maybe, maybe you're not going to do it because it's jQuery and you, you don't feel 100%. Uh, <laughs> it's very hacky. It all yeah. is very hacky. But do you think this is going to be open source maybe? Someday? I'd actually do want to because, yeah. uh, so I have two workshops, as I mentioned, right? So that means that anytime I figure out something, like, oh, this is great, I'm going to add this. It's prototyped on whichever one I happen to be working on at the moment, and then it has to be ported over. So it just so happened that I was working on the Pandas one. So it's been sticking on, like it's been on a branch on my personal computer for a while. I haven't pushed it up uh, this weekend, hopefully. Nice, um, yeah, push it up to GitHub. Yes, yeah. but I want to have um, an open source, because I plan on doing more workshops on different things. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily data science related. I'm thinking about uh, one on like PyTest. I've started exploring that a bit. Um, and so having something almost like a workshop in it where it then brings in everything I need, because a lot of this I think is like, this is, a, this is the standard like of how I want it to look. And I want it to be consistent, right? Mm -hmm. um, I actually have something kind of similar, but just for myself, is like I have an intro slide that I show um, at any session that I give. So when people come in, they know where to find the content. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, towards the end of last year, I just made like a small little wrapper around that. So it just, it's like a shell script that asks me, where are you presenting? And I type that and it says, work, which workshop are you presenting? And I <laughs> say one or two and it just creates the slide for me and then I have just have to show that, so. Nice. Um, I'm all about automating everything I possibly can. You sound like a software developer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> um, very cool. All right, so we'll have to look out for that library from you in the future. Um, yeah, so that, you know, we can also be automating aspects of our presentation creation. Nice. So, uh, before I was forcing you to talk about all this technical content on automating presentations, which was super interesting, uh, we were about to get into visualizations. So, uh, visualizations play an essential role in data analysis, especially if you're doing some exploratory data analysis. You've never seen a data set before, it can be helpful to plot some things out. You can see things right away. Um, in your book, you say it's easier to find patterns in visualizations. It's more work to arrive at the same conclusion by looking at numbers and tables. And this is a really obvious thing to me. I think I think it's easy to agree with that statement. When you're just looking at tables of data, it isn't always obvious the patterns emerge. But once you plot things, um, it can be super obvious that there's some, some uh, you know, relationships between variables or the shape of distributions can be interesting or outliers can appear. You just learn so much of your data from visualizations. Um, so uh, visualizations are actually so important to you uh, that you've been having a lot of fun lately with your data morph library, which uh, shows some kind of interesting quirks about summary statistics and visualizing 2D data uh, so I'll be sure to include a link to the data morph uh, GitHub project that you have made. And so people can see uh, visually, but so for example, at, at least at the time of recording, at the, the readme at the top of it for the data morph project, there is a 2D plot, a scatter plot of a panda and it turns into a 2D scatter plot of a star, and then it can turn back into a panda, and the dots just kind of all gradually move, but you have these summary statistics on the screen about the mean of the points on the x-axis as well as the y-axis, about the standard deviation of the points um, on the x-axis and the y-axis, and even the correlation between x and y for the points, and all of those things to two decimal point precision stay exactly fixed as you go from panda face to star face, back to panda face. It's fascinating to watch happen. Um, why did you think to do this and what's the point of it? <laughs> so it actually started um, with my workshop, uh, the pandas workshop. So I feel like when you're just having someone or just introducing someone to pandas and you spend an hour and a half talking about wrangling and that's really where pandas sh uh, shines. People maybe who are new to data analysis might be like, well, why do I need to visualize anything? I have these statistics. And I feel like that's also, you know, plotting is significantly harder than just calculating the statistics. So mm -hmm. there is a tendency to like, oh, just do what's easy. You know, this is a quick way to explain right. it. And 
it's it's very dangerous. Um, and so I see data morph as a it's a teaching tool. Um, it's not by it's not my uh, idea. This this idea of having data sets that have the same summary statistics but look very different um, goes back. Um, there's examples. Um, maybe we'll put links to. I think it's actually in the book too. Um, Anscombe's quartet, which is a set of four data sets. And I think there's maybe ten points in each, um, but it shows how like you can have like a, a line where there's just one point off that's an outlier, and that can have the same summary statistics as something that looks very very different. And so, um, in 2017, researchers at Autodesk made um, a thing. Well, they take they use uh, simulated annealing, and they take a dinosaur. Uh, scatter plot, and then they morph that into other images. Um, and so I was thinking, can I make like a fun thing here, like a panda converting into another thing? And so I spent a weekend diving into the, like the very researchy code and trying to get it work for something else because it was clearly like hard coded. Like this works for the dinosaur. Um, and I think at, maybe at some point they had plans to to work more on that, but I don't think it happened. It, it was a challenge. Um, so I got it to work. And then I was really excited about it. I had my image, and then I was like, but this would be so nice if other people could also just play around with it just to see how this kind of thing works. Um, and you know, it's a fun gimmick to have for presentations, right? So I um, spent like the last three months or so <laughs> building this. Um, but it's been a really insightful experience for me also on the software engineering side. So like, this was a lot of refactoring code, thinking about ways that you know, I can get this to work for any data set. So how could I take in a data set and determine where to draw the circle that it should morph into? So you know, you take the means of each direction, right? But then when you're, you may be making a bullseye, so there's two circles. Now how do you decide what the radius should be and how do you vary them? Things that are like the star, where how do you decide where to place that? It's all ratios and it's dependent on the data. Yeah. And so there's a lot of like, interesting thought process on that yeah. and then also figuring out how to do like a very clean test suite which most of the time you won't see in the wild because you're just doing as you go having a chance to come in on something that's small and contained and then build that up mm -hmm. and the same thing with doing docs and publishing a package and it's all stuff that you don't necessarily do or see when you're working internally at a company you have your own company's processes you're working on that way and you don't necessarily have the know-how of how that happens in the wild. And so it's, it's been a very enriching experience and I've learned a lot and I've brought a lot back to my work as well from the nice. experience. Are you stuck between optimizing latency and lowering your inference costs as you build your generative AI applications? Find out why more ML developers are moving toward AWS Trainium and Inferentia to build and serve their large language models. You can save up to 50% on training costs with AWS Trainium chips and up to 40% on inference costs with AWS Inferentia chips. Trainium and Inferentia will help you achieve higher performance, lower costs, and be more sustainable. Check out the links in the show notes to learn more. All right, now back to our show. Yeah, so it's, um, it's useful for your visualization teaching because it's a data visualization, clearly. It's useful for your other kind of teaching because it shows this statistical effect um, and how lots of different shapes, including in this case, animations of shapes, morphing, data morphing between different shapes. And there's like a dozen or so different kinds of shapes that you have out of the box that work. More to come. And more to come. <laughs> uh, and you can contribute yes, your own as yes. well now, because this is, this is a live GitHub project and yeah, it, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. And so, uh, yeah, so it, as a statistical concept, it shows how so many different kinds of graphs, so many different kinds of shapes can have the same mean along both axes, the same standard deviation along both, both axes, and the same correlation. Mm -hmm. So that's super interesting. And you use something called simulated annealing in order to allow this animation, this morphing to happen. What is, what's simulated annealing? So simulated annealing is a, an AI technique. So you start out, and I think it's easiest to me to always think about this in terms of like particle movements, I guess. So if you think about something when it's in a gaseous state, things are moving very, very fast. So you can even see in the, the visual which reader, uh, people who are listening can go and, and look. Um, but at that point, you're, you're more willing to accept points that maybe move farther than you would like from your target shape. Um, and then over time, you, you, you're kind of going more into the solid state 
in that sense. So the temperature, you're actually using temperature. Um, so that is decreasing over time. And so over time, you're, you're more strict with what you'll allow. So initially, you get like big, bigger movements, and then it kind of like slowly will converge onto the shape mm, that you so, want. Uh, so temperature is a, is a variable yes. in the simulated annealing. And as temperature increases, the particles, the dots... In temperature, the, you decrease the temperature. Uh, so oh. you start high, and then you decrease it down. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, but so uh, just kind of generally speaking, if you, if you increase the temperature, the particles move more. Yes. Just like heat mm -hmm. in uh, actual particles in real life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's more like... Uh, at higher temperatures, you're more willing to accept something that's like bad. Right. So maybe you move the point in the wrong direction. But the reason you need this is because otherwise you can fall very easily into a local minimum. Uh, so you want to make sure you're, you're properly optimizing. So it's kind of like a hill climbing uh, model. Cool. Very interesting. So uh, check it out. Uh, Data Morph Package, it illustrates how, yeah, it's staggering all these different kinds of shapes that have these fixed mean, standard deviation, correlation, um, and you can watch in real time as you morph between these shapes with all those um, uh, summary statistics being fixed. Um, and so, yeah, so the, whole, the reason why I brought that whole project up is because clearly you're really into visualizations, and it also <laughs> gave our listeners a taste of um, these software development principles that you instill to your students in person as well as in your book. Um, so things like test cases um, and just creating open source software, well documented. Object oriented programming. That'll make it easy. If anyone wants to add a shape, it'll now be much easier than it would have been in the past because of that. Like small, modular, reusable code. Nice. Very important. Um, so uh, back to the visualizations um, and the way that you talk about them in your book, um, you provide uh, an overview of different plots available in pandas and matplotlib. Um, and then in chapter six, you introduce Seaborn for relatively advanced plotting. So what are the kinds of things that people might wanna do in pandas directly? When would you want to get into matplotlib? And then in what situations should you be considering using this, these relatively advanced plotting techniques in Seaborn? So I think it kind of depends on what your data looks like. So if you're working with wide format data, then you want to just prototype something, then pandas is definitely going to be a very natural fit because it's just part of your chaining. No need to reshape the data. Um, but when you want to do something beyond that initial just plot, show the things, or maybe there's certain things that you can't necessarily pass down, like removing the spines off of the plot, then you'll have to reach for matplotlib. Mm. And so I think it's, it's very nice to have the intro to the plotting be pandas because at that higher level, you just get a feel for what goes where and how things plug in. And then you can go into matplotlib and see exactly how things are happening under the hood and where you can plug in or where you can tweak and refine what you're, what you're looking for. And then Seaborn, um, if you have, instead of the, the wide format data, the long format data or some kind of mix. So very good example and one where I will typically reach for Seaborn quickly is if you have a column that maybe you want to color the data by. That's going to be very painful in pandas because you have to reshape everything and it might not actually necessarily be that easy to do for what the visualization you're going for. And Seaborn makes that very easy. Um, one of the examples I actually have in my data visualization uh, workshop is we take um, Stack Overflow questions that were tagged with a, a set of data, or, well, yeah, data libraries in Python. And we show their growth in the questions that are tagged like that over time. And what's interesting is if you look at the questions that were tagged with Seaborn, but were actually before, like they were created before Seaborn was ever created, you see people will go back later and then tag at Seaborn once there's a better way to do something. And one of those, the first one I think I have, or one I call attention to at least, is about coloring the data. So you can find some pretty nasty looking code that you'll have to do and looping just to get it in matplotlib. And it becomes a trivial one-liner in, in Seaborn. Um, I also I find that Seaborn is just prettier. It is very nice. So that comes from the style sheets, though. So you can use with matplotlib the Seaborn style sheet. They have like cross-ported it. So got it. All right, nice. So pandas makes it very easy to get started on plotting. Matplotlib allows for a bit more advanced control over the plots. So for example, if you want to remove the tick marks, that kind of thing, you can do that in matplotlib. And then Seaborn, we have even more flexibility, 
particularly with respect to things like colors, working with colors is easy. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, in general, aesthetics um, are very easy. It's even the defaults in Seaborn, like that especially, like the defaults in Seaborn, the same kind of plot relative to Matplotlib, yeah. it's, it's just, it tends to look really pretty out of the yes. box. Um, and uh, before we started recording, you mentioned to me something about Matplotlib, and I can't remember what this was, but there was something that you were like, there's something that people should know about Matplotlib that most people don't. Ticker. Ticker. The ticker module in uh, Matplotlib. I always have this. I, it's in the book. It's in uh, my trainings. So it, there are often times where you're maybe visualizing a quantity that maybe has a set of units or let's say percentages, and you have now zero to one, or do you multiply by a hundred, or if you wanted to normalize based on a constant factor, you can actually just use the ticker and do all that for you. So you simply you, know, you import ticker, obviously, and then you, you just hook it up to the axis that you're, you're working with. So you can say, in this case, um, on this plot that I'm working with, the y-axis is a percent. So you pass it the percent formatter, and you tell it what's the base. So if you just say 1, that means they're, all, they're already percentages. Mm -hmm. So it'll multiply by whatever factor it needs to and tax on the percent for you. And so you have a, a, already a huge improvement in how the plot looks. Um, and then within ticker, you have you know, various kinds of ways to format the ticks and also to place the ticks. So maybe you're working with data that's clearly strictly integers, but maybe your scale is small enough that Matplotlib shows you fractional units and you don't want that there. That's easy to correct with ticker. Nice. So the ticker module makes it easier to format and place ticks in your plots, ultimately making it easier for you um, to convey some specific concept to your viewer. Yes. Um, perfect. Nice. All right. Thank you for all those visualization tips. Another thing that you are obviously expert at and you cover a lot in your book is statistics. So uh, we've been talking about this a little bit. So, you know, summary statistics like mean, standard deviation, correlation, these are the kinds of concepts that people know, but statistics goes a lot deeper. There's a lot of frequentist Bayesian techniques to be analyzing data um, that, um, you know, we can solve a lot of the same problems. Uh, especially if they're on relatively small data sets with statistical approaches as opposed to machine learning methods. Um, but statistical approaches, they can have really useful things with them that we rarely get in machine learning, like p-values, confidence values, that allow us to have some uh, an estimate of how much we should um, trust, say, an experimental result. Um, could be an A-B test on your web platform um, where you could say, oh, you know, it is statistically significant, uh, this difference between user behavior in case A and case B. And so therefore, um, we can feel comfortable moving ahead with this product decision. Or uh, in more serious things like, this seems like this drug works and we should give it to patients. Um, A-B testing and saving lives, almost exactly the same <laughs> usefulness <laughs> in the real world. So uh, statistics, hugely useful. And probably when people are getting started in data science, there are so many different things for them to tackle. There's the programming things like just learning pandas. There's learning the theory of statistics and understanding the importance of that. So um, what do you think if someone's getting started with data analysis, do you think that they should dive more into statistics first or dive more into the programming aspects like understanding how pandas works? Uh, I think that depends on you know, first of all, a person's learning style, um, maybe where they're more interested. You might be more interested on the coding side and more interested on the statistic side. Um, you don't want to get discouraged. So maybe if you're really interested in statistics and the coding scares you a little bit, maybe do some of the statistics, get really invested and interested. And then you can take a step back and say, okay, how do these statistics map to different uh, methods in pandas? And then maybe the reverse too. If statistics is a bit overwhelming and you want to approach it from the code side, um, I think it's just important kind of just to do what works for you and stay yeah. positive about it. Yeah, and I think it's great to, to do them together. For me personally, I love learning the stuff hands-on, as I can imagine somebody who wrote a book called Hands-On Data yeah. Analysis <laughs> would agree. And so, yeah, for example, I created um, a statistics for machine learning course, and I am publishing that. I published the first few lectures on YouTube like a year ago, and then I've been completely overwhelmed with work. And we'll get back to that, I promise, those of you who are following on YouTube or on my Udemy course. Uh, but people can get it from O'Reilly. It's like an eight-hour course. 
and it's and everything is done in Jupyter Notebooks in in large part with pandas because it's such an easy way to just play around with things and say, mm -hmm. oh, like what if I change this parameter or what if I change this data set? And it just makes it so easy and fun. I think one thing you have to be a little careful about from the panda side just came to mind is just how different libraries in the ecosystem treat like standard deviation, mm -hmm. whether it's sample population. And right. it's not always obvious what's there. So yes. read, read the docs before you uh, dive in and get confused about why math answers don't match. That is something that, uh, so we end up doing that in my course. So there's like, there's a degrees of freedom parameter yep. that I remember, I can't remember which way it goes, but it was like, yeah, if I calculate the standard deviation in NumPy uh, using the default parameters, if I want to get the exact same number in pandas, then I need to specify this degrees of freedom to be slightly different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a really good catch. Yeah, so in addition to statistical analysis, in your book, you also specifically dig into financial analysis. So you dedicate an entire chapter to financial analysis using the stock analysis package that you built. Um, so can you explain the motivation behind creating this package and how it can help users? So I think there's a couple pieces to that. So the first thing is um, there's a lot that can be done with analyzing finance. There's tons of metrics that can be calculated and for the most part, uh, some of them can be explained easily, and I think it's something that everyone at least can understand, you know, why you would want to analyze that or like the different aspects of what you would want to be looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and then I chose to make a package, and actually I didn't tell you this before, but this, um, when I had the idea for this chapter, I think I was um, on vacation and I had to ask for an extra two weeks, I think, to work on it because I was like, oh my God, I have the best idea. I'm going to make a package. And it's going to show people how they can make reusable modular code that they can share within their team that just to see, show how you can be a person who's working uh, with data, an anal analyst, a data scientist, but still understand how, what it takes to write good code. Because um, that's only going to help you later when you revisit it understanding what, what you did, why you did it, being able to explain it to people, other people to benefit from it. Um, and so the way I actually structured the package is so you can see a bunch of different concepts. So there's like a static class and like why it would make sense to do something like that, why you would need to store some information in the init for like reading things in. Um, and so it tries to hit on a bunch of different concepts to give you a good breadth of of knowledge of how you would structure, how you would make a package, you know, how you would build classes, how you would approach the problem. Um, and it's meant to be something that people can fork and then build upon and like, oh, I want to add this other method. I want to see how this works. So kind of like a, a Lego starter kit, if you will. Cool. That's great. Yeah. So the purpose of this package, um, it maybe wasn't primarily about giving somebody a financial analysis mm -hmm. library. It was more about providing the Lego blocks, yeah. the, building, uh, the building blocks for understanding how to build great uh, open source software packages that are shared in GitHub uh, and that uh, you know, follow the standards, the high standards that uh, software developers expect. And that maybe a lot of data, analysis, uh, data analysts and data scientists aren't familiar with already. Yeah. Cool. And uh, you, you took a three week vacation to do that. No, no, I wasn't taking the vacation to do it. I think I had the idea while I was on the vacations. I think uh, it was kind of like I had to finish before the vacation and I had my time. And then I was like, I'm, this idea is too good and I'm not going to make the deadline. I have to say uh, something. But I think, I I think it, was, it was worth it because oh, I get the, a lot of comments. The book deadline. The book deadline. Uh, I see. I, so I get yeah. a lot of comments. Sorry, I thought you were readers. asking for two more weeks off of work. Oh, to work on it. You were no, asking for no, no, a two no. week extension. Well, because uh, I was yeah. only working on it on the weekend. So. You know, you imagine two weeks is just like another two days, another few days. So it's just not much. Um, but I, but I frequently get like comments and people say that you know they like the book and what were your favorite chapters. It's almost always that is one of them. Just oh. seeing how you could. It's not so much like because other stuff is going to be available in a lot of spots. Like I can learn how to use different aspects of the library. Um, once they've seen it the first time, they can consult other things. But seeing how you would structure things like in practice and that's like a very hands-on chapter and that's a big thing that people highlight. Sweet. Um, yeah, that sounds super useful. It sounds like something that I should personally be brushing up on. Um, the data scientists on my team would probably appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and, and not to mention the software developers at our company. Um, so uh, 
Clearly, open source is an important thing to you. We've touched on it a number of times in this episode, including just now with this topic of this financial analysis package and how people find it so useful for understanding how to create these open source packages. So you've contributed to many of the key open source libraries that data scientists use, including Pandas, Scikit-learn, Matplotlib, Seaborn, and NumPy. So what drew you to maintain all these open source tools that data scientists know and love? Uh, yeah, what, what galvanized you to do that in the first place? So I think uh, being a software engineer, uh, that's, it's kind of in my nature. If I see something's not working or an example of like, this doesn't make sense and you try to figure out how to actually use it, um, can I improve the documentation? Can I fix the bug that's in there? Waiting for it to be fixed versus fixing it yourself, it's, you know, you're going to wait a lot longer and then you can just get it fixed very fast. Um, and it's also, you know, part of wanting to be part of that community, right? So you're using that stuff, you're benefiting from it, and the whole culture of open source is to then, you know, pay it forward and give back. Mm -hmm. You see something's wrong, you go fix it, and everyone wins. And nice. it's also just a fun experience to, to explore. You learn a bit more about the library when you have to dig into it. How am I going to add this functionality? How does this thing work? Yeah. Even the documentation examples, it's like you can find what they call meta issues, where maybe they'll list a library where like, oh, we need document, we need examples for all of these methods. Just pick one. And I actually picked some, and NumPy has one right now on um, masked arrays. And I picked one in there, and it ended up in Datamorph, because I'm like, this is exactly what I need. So you can, you can easily find things that you have no idea were there, but just because you have to now, oh, I'm going to help them make an example for here, mm -hmm. you have to figure out how it works. Why would you use it and make mm -hmm. an example? Yeah, so it's one of those, uh selfishly benevolent things that people do, like writing a book, where you're like, <laughs> I'm going to do this great thing for society, but simultaneously you're learning so much more in depth that you become a much better expert yourself. And then you do sometimes get praised. So nice. uh, one of the things I added while procrastinating for one of my final, or maybe it was a midterm exam, uh, my master's degree, I was scrolling through the Seaborn issues and I saw one where they wanted to add horizontal and vertical reference lines to uh, plot grids, mm -hmm. um, and this was like a, at this point in time, like a year or so old. And I was like, I can do this, and so put off the studying, and uh, I quickly implemented that. And it's something that I always highlight in my workshop that after an hour in, everyone can make that contribution. It's just a matter of understanding the underlying library. And you know, right when that came out, there was a it was a tweet. The I don't remember who it was from now. I could show you later, but uh, <laughs> but there was a tweet. Um, a guy who runs a blog is like, oh, I just, this great ref line functionality is now in Seaborn. And nice. then the creator tagged me. He's like, oh, thanks, Stephanie. And I'm like, that, that was an amazing experience. Yeah, too. that must be super rewarding, particularly if you're using a library, like one of these libraries that most data scientists use mm -hmm. and that you've contributed to. You come across this issue that everybody may or may not be aware that they're experiencing. And then you fix that and you can see downstream when that gets integrated into the major release. Yep. And it's fixed, like knowing that you did that yourself, that must be satisfying. Oh, it's amazing. And it's very nice because everyone is, is wants contributions. They're going to thank you. If they can give you a shout out, you'll get a shout out. So it's, it's a very rewarding experience. Sweet. So it might be mind blowing to our listeners that with all of the open source work that you do and all the writing you do and all the teaching you do, that none of that is your day job. No. <laughs> so you do all of this stuff on the side. Yes. <laughs> so uh, you work at Bloomberg, which is one of the world's leading providers of financial data, uh, if not the leading uh, global provider. I think it's certainly the biggest brand in that space uh, in, as a financial data provider. And uh, your role there, as we've alluded to, uh, combines both software engineering and data science. So you research and develop solutions to help improve and automate Bloomberg's information security processes using data and machine learning. Given that it's information security, my expectation is that you cannot tell us very much about this job on a podcast. Um, please list the most vulnerable. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, if you could, if, if there's anything about the role that you can tell us, you know, the, the kinds of at a high level um, software libraries that, that you're using or uh, maybe th things that have been open source from work there. I don't know if there's anything you can share us share with us. 
I'm sure it'd be interesting for our listeners to hear um, what what's involved with being a software engineer and data scientist at Bloomberg. Yeah, so my team, um, we're a small team, so it's very scrappy, and you know, you're going to be learning lots of new things. Before going there, I didn't know how to do like the infrastructure side of things, so I learned how to like set up cloud machines and like configure them and get them working with like the full stack, DevOps. right? DevOps. Uh, yeah, Apache, um, and then moving into you know Python is our back end, and then we have uh, React as our front end, and you know also in interfacing with the database. So it's the full stack. Um, I also do some D3 work. So one thing I can share um, is, uh, I guess, uh, last year I was working on a um, what I call an explorable Sankey. Cool. So in D3, if you were just to throw your data at it and say, make me a Sankey, it's like, sure. But if you give it too much data, then it crashes your browser. So <laughs> not, so, <laughs> not so great. Um, so what I decided to do, and this actually came as an idea from a coworker who I was creating the visualizations for, um, said it would be great if you could just click through and explore it. And it was something that, um, it, you know, it sounds like a cool idea, like a pipe dream, right? But um, you know, at the time I was, uh, you know, doing my master's, and so I guess like just more thinking about the data structure side, it happened to be like a data structure course, and that was kind of what cracked it open for me. I was like, wait, actually, this is this is definitely possible, and it's just creative use of the data structure. Um, and so what I'm able to do now is you can give it a ton of data. And it knows, OK, I'm going to show three levels of the Sankey. But I need to do a roll up here and group this into other. Mm -hmm. And then if I want to see what's in there, I can maybe hover over it to get a peek or click into it. And that's a way that now someone can explore their data visually rather than having to like mine through rows and rows of, of, mm -hmm. of textual information. That's also it's a perfect case study, what you just described, of how Despite us moving to this world where algorithms like GPT-4 can write great code, and there's, you know, I have people commenting on YouTube videos for the podcast saying, is there any point in me getting started in a data analyst job or data science job uh, now that there's all this automation? And what you've said there just is a perfect case in point on one of the kinds of things that is not going to go away for the foreseeable future, which is understanding the fundamentals of our field. So, you know, I've created content on linear algebra, uh, calculus, probability theory, statistics, and data structures and algorithms for, in my case, machine learning specifically. Uh, so all this, you know, this is content that I've released. Uh, it's all available in O'Reilly today and uh, will eventually all be on YouTube. The linear algebra and calculus already is and the probability theory stuff should start coming out again soon. And eventually I'll get through, through all that content and it will all be publicly available for free. Um, but uh, the, so you gave this perfect example of how your understanding of algorithms and data structures from the formal masters that you were pursuing in machine learning uh, provided you with this, oh, this thing that seemed like a pipe dream is actually just, a, we just need to understand the data structure and we can make this thing happen in real life. It's actually just clever manipulation of that. Like how can I take you know, maybe this massive graph and then like selectively group bits that act like this is a subgraph, but you're not actually showing them. And it, that's really, it's amazing kind of when you have these breakthroughs, like it's like, oh, that was actually so simple, but it's the, the thinking outside the box that like you said, I think that's always gonna be something that, that we have the advantage over. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, so now that our listeners kind of have this full perspective of all the things that you've done or are doing. So uh, you work full time in what I'm sure is a demanding role at Bloomberg. You have written two editions of your book, you do teaching, and uh, recently you completed a master's in computer science from Georgia Tech with a machine learning specialization, doing all that at the same time. And I would also, I would, something that I've recommended on episodes in the past, but haven't in a while, I haven't personally done the Georgia master's course, but when people come to me and they already have an undergraduate background and they're, they're wondering like how they can be advancing themselves uh, professionally as a data scientist, that is my number one go-to recommendation. If they're like, if you want to do a serious like multi-year um, program, um, it's relatively affordable. It is super rigorous. And um, yeah, so obviously I highly recommend it. What, what drew you to, to pick that, um, that program? Well, I needed one online for obvious reasons, <laughs> scheduling. Um, 
I just liked the approach. I liked for me that it was more of a, a software engineering focus. So I did the, the CS program. Um, and I liked that it was approaching the ML side, but with heavy, heavy CS concepts. Mm -hmm. um, I found that like the other programs that I looked into that were on the ML side were a lot more maybe on the math and the concepts, which wasn't really going to get me to where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, this role at Bloomberg was actually my first software engineering role, really. I was kind of doing like some hybrid thing in, in a previous job, but it was all like self-taught. So what I loved about the rigor and, and the course selection was that I was like growing at double speed mm -hmm. while pursuing, you know, working and then and doing the master's. Um, I learned a, a tremendous amount from it. I would definitely recommend uh, that program to anyone considering it. Nice. And uh, going back a little further into your history, you have a undergrad in operations research from Columbia University, uh, from the engineering school there. And you are not uh, the only guest that's recently been on that has that kind of background. So uh, Josh Wills in episode number 665 um, also came from that kind of background. And it provided him with a tremendous foundation for, like you, doing a ton of extremely valuable work, both for the public as well as for um, private companies, for fast growing tech companies across software engineering and data science. So what is it about, what is operations research to recap for our listeners and why was that so useful to you uh, in everything you've been able to do in your career so far? So I'm gonna rewind actually. So I went into school for chemical engineering and after one semester I realized that, that was not gonna happen. And at the time, I had never taken a computer science course at all. Mm. Um, and then I had to find a major that didn't require more chem. <laughs> and that was operations research. Um, and then I had to take computer science. And that was very scary for me. But what I really liked about the operations research program is that it's not like you're focusing just on one thing, really, like in chem or bio um, or econ. You get a breadth of a lot of things. And so you're, you're, it's almost like a problem solving degree in optimization, right? So you get the econ background, you get the stats background, you get the coding background, you get like simulation, like all these things that um, are like very helpful on understanding the business, understanding the data and, and being able to work hands on with things. So um, there was a point where after I had graduated and I, I was in the workforce and I started getting really into coding again and thinking, oh, maybe I should have done a computer science degree. Um, but now I've come to the point where I'm like, no, that was definitely the right degree because it really set me up for a breadth of, of options. And just having those different um, areas where you can draw upon is, is tremendously helpful, I think. Nice, yeah, super cool. It sounds like a fascinating and, and useful uh, background uh, kind of thing that you know I wish I'd known about <laughs> uh, back when I was doing chemistry. Um, so, all right, uh, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, how do you, uh, when you have all these things going on, when you're working full-time at Bloomberg, when you're uh, writing your book and doing a master's, how, like, how do you do that? What, do you have productivity tips for us? Well, first of all, stop sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so for me, it, it really became down to it. You, you have to accept that there's no way you're going to get all the stuff done. And it becomes a exercise in prioritization. Mm -hmm. So at any given point, there's going to be things that like absolutely have to be done now. Things mm -hmm. that maybe can wait a, slight, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Things also you have to realize, is this really necessary? Do I need to spend another three hours to get like another one point up on what this is? Mm -hmm. Or are those three hours better spent on tackling this other thing that hasn't gotten any attention in a while? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, in, in summary, so for me, uh, it's very important having the knowledge of what you know the levels of prioritization, what really needs to be done right now, what can wait, and then structuring. I'm a big fan of to do lists, so structuring that, um, maybe subdividing things. And I, I went through several periods and like, what's the best way to do my to do list? And at one point, I had like a school to do list and a work to do list and like another to do list. Then you find that maybe you're not picking the right things off the right piles at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, but there's gonna be some level where it's just gonna be, you have to figure out what works for you. Are you a list person? Are you a reminder person? Um, but definitely the, the prioritization and, and what needs to be done right now versus what can be done tomorrow. 
um, and not trying to do everything is very important. Nice. Yeah. Prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Um, so given how much you have accomplished in your career already, uh, certainly big things are ahead in the rest of your career. So what are you hoping to look back on perhaps when you retire many decades from now? <laughs> um, well, one thing I know that I'm going to look back very fondly um, is the fact that I went and got started in um, the public speaking angle of it. Right. That was something that you know, I'm very introverted. So doing that the first time was very scary. I, um, I would genuinely have never <laughs> guessed that from this interview experience. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it was something that I like. I had after writing the book thought like I had seen other people. Um, you know, in my circle that had spoken at conferences. And I thought, you know, one day I'll do that. It wasn't something I was actively pursuing because, again, that kind of a thing is very scary the first time you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I did get an invitation um, during the pandemic um, from ODSC to do it virtually. And I discovered that I really enjoyed, like, I enjoyed making the content. That was something I knew already. Um, but I enjoyed, like, actually connecting with the people and doing it, even though it was virtual and it's not really the same. Mm -hmm. And through three times of doing it and being incredibly nervous those three times, I then got to the point where I felt like I could do this in person. And then when I did do it in person, it was so enriching because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really felt like I was making a difference. I was connecting with those people. I, and then the feedback afterwards, it was just like, this was like, I absolutely want to keep doing this and I want to do this again because I feel like I'm, I'm making a difference and I'm helping people. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's definitely one thing. And I think kind of just looking back at the impact, right? So like the fact that there's a book and it helps people and the open source contributions and, and that fact that I've, you know, made a name for myself. Nice. That's a great answer. Um, so, uh, beyond your book, uh, do you have a book recommendation for us? So one of the things I promised myself when I finished my master's degree, and I wrote this down on a plane to motivate myself to study for my final, um, was my freedom list, all the things that I was going to do when I finally graduated. Mm -hmm. One of them was reading because I was an avid reader once upon a time, fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've made it through one book <laughs> since. <laughs> and then I started Datamorph and I haven't read anything. Mm -hmm. That book was the Hunger Games prequel. Which I did enjoy. I like the Hunger Games. Cool. Before they were hungry. Before they were hungry. No, they were still hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was good. Um, a book I have to read in my to read pile is um, Brag Better, which I hear very good things about. So mm, I am looking forward to, nice. to digging into that. Cool. So it's about kind of just uh, being comfortable representing yourself publicly or something. Yeah. And I feel like that. It, in it's, meetings. In meetings. Yeah. And I feel like learning are just doing the public speaking in general has made me a lot better and a lot more comfortable in meetings. And it's definitely like skill transfer there. Um, it's more about like kind of your elevator pitch or like how do you talk to about yourself? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's more, I think, focused towards women because there's studies that show that you, you, you feel a little uncomfortable. And I know I do. And so it's just, you know, mm -hmm. reframing your, your thoughts. Um, at work, actually, we had, I got a free copy um, signed by the author. We had an event at work and, and she spoke about the book and, and she, was, she was great. So I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into that. Nice. That sounds like a great recommendation. Uh, and then for people who want to get more recommendations for you and hear what you're up to, your latest, uh, after this episode, how should people follow your work? So GitHub, obviously, <laughs> for code work and uh, the workshops and the book repos all, all on GitHub. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and Twitter. Nice. Uh, well, Stephanie, thank you so much for an awesome, highly informative episode. Thank you for making the trek down to film with me in person. It's been a ton of fun. And we're going to have to catch up with you again sometime in the future, I hope. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks again for having me, John. Thoroughly enjoyed hanging out with Stephanie today and learning so much from her. In today's episode, she filled us in on how chaining and assigning are her favorite pandas data wrangling tricks, how pandas is great for creating plots quickly, but matplotlib allows for more flexibility, particularly through the ticker module that she highlighted, and Seaborn is best for handling colors and creating aesthetically pleasing visuals with minimal effort. 
She also talked about how her data morph Python library enables you to gradually transform a 2D scatter plot from one elaborate shape to another elaborate shape without impacting the axes means, standard deviations, or correlation. She talked about how package creation is useful for data scientists to learn how to create excellent shareable code, how at Bloomberg she uses a Python backend, a React frontend, and D3 for visualizations, and how ruthless prioritization is the key to her remarkable productivity. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Stephanie's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 675. That's superdatascience.com slash 675. I encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by tagging me in public posts or comments on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. And if you'd like to engage with Stephanie and me in person, as opposed to just through social media, we'd love to meet you in real life at the Open Data Science Conference East, ODSC East, which is coming up next week in Boston from May 9th to May 11th. I'll be doing two half-day tutorials. One will introduce deep learning with hands-on demos in PyTorch and TensorFlow, and the other, which is brand new, will be fine-tuning, deploying, and commercializing with large language models, including GPT-4. In addition to these two formal events, I'll also just be hanging around and grabbing beers and chatting with folks. It'd be so fun to see you there. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science Podcast episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another excellent episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors whom I've hand-selected as partners because I expect their products to be genuinely of interest to you. Please consider supporting this free show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Finally, thanks, of course, to you for listening. It's because you listen that I'm here. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.